Hello and welcome to IEEE Soft Robotics Podcast. In this podcast, we are going to interview researchers from both academia and industry about their work, thoughts, spectrum, and more beyond that. This is Marwa Edwini, and I hope you will find this podcast useful. If you would like to connect with us, simply send us, and we will be happy to hear from you. And here is my interview. Thanks. So I'd like to ask you first how you'd like uh, to define yourself. Oh, I like to think of myself, I think, as a fairly pragmatic or practical roboticist. I like building stuff. I like programming. Uh, I like seeing, yeah, I think I like seeing code and theory come together and work in a machine that does something useful. I think more recently I've started to think of myself as an educator. And I think that's something that's grown on me. So I think I'm transitioning from thinking of myself as a researcher uh, and, a, and a builder of machines to, uh, to an educator. That's great. Of course, first of all, I'm so grateful for what you did in MATLAB. So this was undergrad, so robotics toolbox. And you used that? Fantastic. Good <laughs> future day. But uh, I'd like to ask you what's the difference between being educator and researcher. Mm -hmm. Sometimes we had the both rule, but why do you say it's different for you? I think it's a bit of sort of personal mindset as to how, how you how you think of your of yourself. Uh, I I guess is you have a career in research. I worked for a government uh, research agency for a long time before I went to university and became a professor. But in that previous life, uh, the government research lab life and the university life, it's all about research, right? You have to come up with good ideas and work with your students and write papers and get them published and collect the citations, right? That's the, that's the little wheel that we run around inside of, right? Uh, that's, what, that's what drives us. And, you know, you, you get promoted based on that and you win research grants based on that. So a lot of academics are very, I guess, preoccupied with this, uh, this academic game, the academic pursuit, right? And I, I think most academics work at a university, right? So you're also supposed to teach, but it's kind of like research is the number one priority and teaching is kind of second, third, fourth, fifth, fifth priority. And when I went to the university, this was in 2010, I moved to university and I wasn't really very interested in teaching. I didn't think I was interested in teaching. So when I was negotiating for my position at the university, you know, with the dean and we're going backwards and forwards on the contract. And I wanted it written in the contract that I wouldn't do very much teaching, very little teaching, because I thought it would be a distraction from research. And it's odd, within two, three years of getting to the university and teaching in front of a classroom, which I hadn't done really for a very, very long time, I really enjoyed it. And so actually, I, in some ways, it's kind of a, be the highlight of my week now is interacting with undergrad students and giving lectures. That was before COVID, right? With COVID, giving video lectures is a pretty dispiriting experience, actually. But giving a lecture in front of a class with some engagement, some audience participation, yeah, that's good. It's good as it gets. But I'm curious to ask you, maybe because many, you, you said something, actually, that's reality, but teaching sometimes is, is not easy. And what could be the element do you think make a good teacher of robotics? What could be that something? Because it's not everyone capable to be a good teacher. It's, it's not easy. Sure. And many of us who are involved in teaching at universities, I think we're just expected to teach. You don't actually get taught to teach. Uh, you know, it's your job. You get appointed as a young professor and then, hey, you're, next, next month you're going to be teaching this class. OK, well, that's interesting and maybe a bit challenging, maybe a bit scary. What's important? I think it's important to to know your material and be confident about it because if you're not the students can smell that a mile off like they can sm dogs can smell fear students can smell a lecturer who an academic who, do who doesn't know their stuff and i think it's also helpful that if it's your if it's your passion uh not just that you know the stuff but that you are really enthusiastic you love the stuff i think that comes across as well in a in a very positive way and i know my students online students and face-to-face -face class students comment on my enthusiasm for the topic. And I think enthusiasm is a little bit infectious. And, and that, that's pretty good because if you know, you're passionate, enthusiastic, and that can, some of that can rub off on the students and they become enthusiastic, I think that's motivating for them. 
Uh, so I think that's probably that's probably the most important thing. That it's hard. You can't just turn on passion and enthusiasm. I think probably some of it comes from personality, but I think you've got to really love your stuff and want to share it with everybody. So if I ask you what may be the hard, still hard problem in robotics or something, do you think robotics we have to, yeah, consider more this point research? You have been working in vision problem and, for example. So I don't know what you think still hard problems in robotics in general. Yeah, there's lots of there's lots of hard problems. I mean, if you think about it, you think what we all want robots to be. Uh, a lot of that comes from fiction, from Hollywood, right? We see robots in movies that are so different to the robots we have in our labs, right? So why don't we have robots like that? Well, there's a whole bunch of reasons why we don't have robots like that. So I think there's lots and lots of lots and lots of hard problems from engineering problems around cost, around energy, around reliability, around why robots are just so hard to program. Why do we spend so much time programming robots? It hasn't got any easier. Uh, we've got more software to choose from, but it's still that's still very hard. So they're engineering issues. Uh, and then you know, on, the, on the, the software side, I guess it's, how do we do this intelligence thing? And you know, it's early days, maybe we've been making good progress for a bit under a decade, I think. Uh, supervised learning, more recently reinforcement learning. And initially I was quite skeptical about all, all that stuff, but I have to say that you know, results that I see are really quite impressive. So I think understanding how learning works, under, figuring out how to do learning more efficiently, uh, how to create learned systems that are, that just got smaller hardware footprint. You know, if you consider, I use this example a lot, you know, our brain consumes 18 watts of power pretty much constantly, yeah? And, you know, some of the algorithms we come up with today, that you know, deep learned systems, you know, they run in a, a rack of GPUs, right, to, to work properly. They're probably sucking down kilowatts, right? So what's different about a rack of GPUs versus the, the architecture that we have in our heads? That's a really interesting problem to me. In fact, to me, it's probably the, one of the more interesting problems at the moment. Because I think we are going to use learning for... For visual perception, we're going to use it uh, increasingly for control. And, and that's a whole really interesting thing because I studied electrical engineering uh, when I was an undergraduate and I was really interested in control theory. So I kind of took you know, un extra units in control theory and did my master's in control. And the sort of the classical control and even what we used to call modern control, which is now classical, uh, I wonder if we're going to be teaching that in 10 to 20 years time. Uh, will we just learn everything and not have classical, classical control, not have control theory? Don't know, that's interesting. So I think the generation of young researchers at the moment are kind of a transition generation that they've probably been trained in all of that old stuff, but they're really interested and excited about the new stuff. All my PhD students, almost all my PhD students, doing work with learning in one way or another uh, so they just seem to be just totally fascinated by it and so the generation after them maybe they just don't know any classical stuff and just do learning we will see i think uh, you said many interesting points but i will ask the first last one you mentioned about uh, do you think the way we choose a solution for the problem because i think the discussion going on that not not every problem has to be solved by, by machine learning or it depends and uh, sometimes it ch should be for example if you can use classic control to solve the problem it depends of course on the, on the nature of the problem do you think that something um frustrates you that 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 we follow the trend in research because if it's more trendy and full following this kind of using this technique it will be have more chance to be get published or be cool research it certainly it certainly will be it seems to be perceived as being cooler research, but it's very inefficient. I, I can make a, I could make a PID controller that's you know got two multiplications and an addition or something like that. You know, it's very efficient. I know if I change this the P number or the D number or the I number, I know what that does. Or we can spend you know days training a deep learned system to do the same thing. I know you say which one's better. Uh, I because of my 
I guess my, my background, my age and what I've spent most of my career doing, I'd go for the PID controller. And you know, if it was a robot involved, I'd probably figure out the kinematics and you know, write down the forward kinematic equation, the inverse kinematic equation. I wouldn't try and learn them, uh, but that's just, that's me. But today you can kind of learn a controller that's got the kinematics and the, and the control algorithm all squished together inside some inscrutable box we don't know how it works. We know it's expensive to train it. Uh, we don't fully understand the failure modes. We can't reason about its performance. There are no performance guarantees. Uh, so all these things are, are challenging. And if we want to have such deep learned systems in control of machines that are out in the phys physical machines in the physical world interacting with humans, yeah, we need to be pretty pretty confident that they're always going to do the right thing and not surprise us. Uh, and I mean, we're kind of neural network machines, right? And we always, we're continually doing surprising things. That's what's great about humans, right? They always do surprising things. But I'm not sure we want robots to do surprising <laughs> things. I think we probably want them to be a bit more, a bit more predictable. So I don't, I don't know. It's a, it's a big, it's a big topic. I don't have any answers, but it's going to be interesting to see the way that this plays out uh, over the over the over the coming years. If I can, if I can just mention just one more thing, I think it's a bit. One of the things that frustrates me with it is there seems to be a lot of almost a, I'd say a black art or a dark art in training a network. Right? There's all these knobs that you adjust, all these hyperparameters. You do this one up and that one down a bit, and you just keep doing this until the network works. How much of that's science, uh, and that that frustrates me a bit. And I think I see my students spending way too much time like adjusting knobs on on networks. And maybe we need to have a science that says how it is you set the you, you adjust the knobs without having to have PhD students just seemingly randomly adjusting them till stuff works. Uh, I'll stop. I'll stop. No, now. no, no. I totally agree with you. I think. Um... Maybe that's a question that what we do in research, for example, because you don't know why, for example, a certain problem has to have a complex solution and there's maybe a simple solution, for example. And when we speak about what we do in research and mm -hmm. in industry or a real application, do you think that something contributes the way we see the solution? I'm not underestimating the either classical control or the new machine learning technique, for example, deep learning. But I mean, do you think the way we think about the deploying the actual research in, in, in industry or a real thing, do you think that's contribute the way we think about solution? Because I think also we have an episode with Professor Raquel. She was, when she went to industry, she was like amazed at how they use simple algorithm to do a real stuff. In academia, it's more complicated. So I don't know, what do you think about that? I think in academia, we tend to have a have a preference for things that are more that are more complicated there, there are lots of techniques that are tried and true i mentioned pid controllers before they're very common in industry because they work and people understand them and they know how to adjust them and for most systems most systems they're more than adequate and in some ways that's why i became a bit disillusioned with control theory because there was all this increasingly theoretical work but hard to see really what its advantage was. What problems were they solving, apart from solving problems for the point of, from the perspective of trying to get more stuff published. So I think there is a difference in the way academics look at the world. And there is sometimes a, a tendency to overcomplicate or, hey, somebody else has done that. I can't use that because it's already been done by someone else. I need to do a new thing uh, so that I can, so I can get it published and so my student can get it published. The interesting thing I think in my career is that I spent 25 years working, as I mentioned, in a government lab. And so that was very much applied research. So, you know, we got funding from industry to, to build stuff. And so, you know, we built gigantic uh, robots for the mining industry, you know, robots for agriculture and robots for environmental monitoring and stuff like that. And so, yeah, we were delivering robots that had to work. Uh, and they had all sorts of constraints on power and size and weight and cost and so on. So I guess I spent a lot of my career yeah, using and appreciating that sort of, that practical side. You, you just 
if it's a sufficient solution, that's good. Then we can move on and we can look at the next problem rather than just spending all your time stuck at the first problem and coming up with more and more complex solutions. Hey, okay, got a solution to this one, tick. Let's move on to the next one. Find a solution for that that works, tick, and then move on. And so, yeah, I think you're right. I think industry and academia have got very different priorities. In, in industry, you've got to ship stuff. You know, you've got to make things work and get them out the door. That's what the boss is paying you for. Uh, the opposite is kind of true at university, right? The boss is paying you to complicate things and write papers, uh, not, to have practic not to have practical achievements. I think successful academics can do both. Right? I think that they can play the academic game, but they can also uh, work with industry. And, you know, there are many successful academics that have started their own companies. So they've got an idea, they've got some practical skills, you know, they can make, make the stuff real and ship it. The insane amount of publication and sometimes you have to cut your research and publish as much as you can. Yeah, there's, we will speak about that. And uh, I don't know how we can improve that. Who's contributed to that? Do you believe it's a problem or it's okay for you? Look, I think it is a problem. And I have to say, I would not like to be a starting out academic today. Uh, so I'm kind of I'm lucky I'm getting toward the end of, end of my career. I've had some, some lucky opportunities along the way. I've been fairly successful in publishing. But I think the pressure is much more extreme now on, on younger academics and they are being measured. Uh, there are so many analytical systems out there that measure the performance of academics. I know my own university, you know, I, there's a website there, which is basically, you know, the academic performance website. And it's how many students are you currently advising? How many have you graduated? How much money did you bring in? How many, think, how many papers did you publish in Q1 journals, this, that, and the other. So they're, they're all under the microscope and being, you know, being studied uh, very carefully and you know their performance their academic career depends on that and so yeah I think it is very stressful because you can't guarantee ever that a paper is going to get published if you have a nice idea you can publish you can submit it to the journal or to a conference yeah, and you know the, the bulk of them don't get don't get accepted right more than half don't get accepted so you know so that's that's tough and sometimes then this leads to I think desperation on the parts of, of people and it leads then to bad behaviors like plagiarism, like dual submissions uh, and, and so on. And in some ways, I think it's just because people are backed into a corner and feel that they, that's the only way they can succeed. It's absolutely not the right thing to do, but I think it's, it says something about the pressure that young academics are, are under. And it's all, it's all across the world now. I mean, it's not just that the top 20 universities, every, every country in the world has got, you know, reading reports about what its academics are doing. And, uh, yep, <laughs> it's hard. So good luck to you in your <laughs> career. You. So coming back to the hard problem, and especially you did robotics simulation to books on MATLAB. I would like to ask you, how do you see the progress in general on simulation for robotics from the physical world because it's so challenging how we can design a robot that can adapt to uncertain environment and we can capture that in simulation and avoid the cost for actual robots. How do you see this problem? It's getting, it's getting better, it's getting much better and there's some fantastic tools around now that can be used for, that can be used for simulation. They probably still struggle a little bit when it comes to to modeling, modeling hard contacts. But in general, there are a lot of tools out there and some of them are really very, very good. So uh, that is one way that you can do, either do robot experiments or it's a way in which you can train, uh, train a deep learned robot, right? It can have its experiences in, in the virtual world rather than in the physical world. And that's cheaper and it's quicker because you can run the simulation faster than real time. So, I think we crossed the threshold with simulation maybe five years ago or something like that. So it is absolutely a, an effective way to, to move forward. I think it's a bit disappointing that we have to rely on simulation and not physical machines. And I think that says something about physical machines are still too, too hard to build. They're still too expensive. 
Uh, and but I think we we lose a certain something by not trying our ideas out on, on physical machines. On the positive side, though, is reproducibility. And that says that if I do some experiments on my robot, custom robot, and I get some results, really nobody else in the world can, can replicate those uh, or, or build on them. Whereas in simulation, if you share a simulation model and the package is, is open or open or available to other people, then yes, other people can, you know, take your algorithm and your simulated robot, and then they can improve their algorithm and try it on your simulated robot and compare their results with your results. And if it's an improvement, well, that's good. Then you publish a, a, a paper with tables of bold numbers and show your algorithm is better than the other one. You can also, I mean, you can also do sort of Monte Carlo studies to handle uh, variation or uncertainty. So you can run your robot in bazillions of simulated environments, each one with slightly different properties and characteristics. And you know, that's a way you can get some, some idea about the robustness of an algorithm using simulation. So I think that's all, that's all powerful. And that will only get better moving into the future. My sadness is that it will tempt people to do less stuff with real mm -hmm. hardware. But do you think how we can reduce, on the other side, the cost of robotics? Because it's very really expensive, as you said. And also we have, we speak about simulation to reality gap. There is many techniques. Do you, how do you see also that also thing, yeah, to avoid this expensive cost, at least for the moment? Look, I don't know why robots are still, are still so expensive. Perhaps it's the hardware is not so expensive these days, but I think it's the, it's the fact that if you want to have robots in your lab, you need to have some research engineers who know about the robots and can, you know, keep the software up to date and help the students when they get stuck. And so I think it's the, the, the hand-holding you need, uh, this, the body of expertise that you need to have in your lab so that you can use physical robots. I think that's probably where the expense is. Uh, if you can afford to have a, a few research engineers, uh, you know, for, for years uh, in your lab, uh, then, then you can probably do usefully, usefully do things with physical robots. But if you've just got a robot and no support for it, then it will probably just gather dust. And I think that's the case in a lot of labs. You know, the professor gets a big bunch of money and they buy the robot and then nobody knows how to use it or the person who knows how to use it leaves and then nobody else knows how to use it or, or the manufacturer of the robot goes, goes bankrupt and then the robot's got no support. All these things yeah, happen. Yeah, that's a good point, yeah. But based on that, do you think we have to, uh, in the community, focus more on the and the soft of brain side or the morphology or the body physical side because you mentioned at the beginning uh, one of the questions that how the brain is it, it consume, consume 18 watts and the reality one hmm. kilowatt for example we we'll speak about GPUs, use the example like that how do you see the the comparison here and, the, and what we do look i personally am not so interested in the morphology the shape side of, of of the robots that's not re ever really been my interest and i'm I guess i'm kind of lucky to have always had colleagues who like building robots so that the body side uh, has not really been an issue for me and i spend most of my time working on software for for robotics not the not the not the me mechanical and electrical design side uh, but both both are important uh, i think if you you look at something like a modern motor car if the complexity of those of those things, all the components that are in it, the exquisite precision with which it's been manufactured, and to be honest, the stupidly low price of that thing, that's sort of what we need to do with, with robots. I mean, the robots we build are not as complicated as a as a cheap car, but they cost more than a, than a cheap car. So it's probably because we don't make robots in sufficient volume. I think that's why they're expensive. They're still they're, they're still rare and unusual. And even in my lab, it's a, it's a, a rare day and a good day if I actually see a robot move, you know? <laughs> I've got lots of people in my lab who've got lots of robots, but it's not every day I actually see a robot just sort of driving past my office. You know, that's not common. It should be common. I don't know why it's not common. Every time we work hard and we say, we're gonna have robots gonna do all the tour, guide, tour guides uh, in our, in our center. So when we have visitors, just the robot can take them around and show them stuff. 
and yeah, we work really hard and we put one together and then, you know, after a few months time, it stopped working and yeah, <laughs> don't know why. Have I thought about, you, don't, you said you don't know why, have you ever thought maybe how we can make robots more? Yeah, just moving and interacting with just the real life. What, what's thing still missing, do you say, believe? Simplicity is missing. They're just too complicated. Uh, machines are complicated and the software stacks uh, that we use are complicated. And partly this is the curse of open source software, right? That you you pull together a whole lot of disparate packages and you put them together. And for a moment in time, they all work and play nicely and you get the thing done. And then, you know, one of the packages updates and it breaks and then it stops communicating with another package. And, you know, in a very short amount of time, then it all stops working again. I think that's, that's my big frustration. I love open source software and I contribute to open source software. I use open source software, but, uh, I think it has led to great complexity. And I think complexity is, is what's holding us back at the moment. We need to find a way to, to simplify. That's a very excellent point because I'm also, uh, first of all, thank you for doing most of stuff freeware and open source. And I'm also a big fan for open source tools and it's a struggle. You, mm. Yeah, sometimes we have buggy, you have to spend days and it's really complex. Although there's adventures, but yeah. I'm glad you mentioned this kind of point first time about the complexity. So how do you see the solution here? I don't know the answer to it. Um, I kind of play tinker around with like my own robotic software, the toolbox, the, the MATLAB one you mentioned earlier, and then there's also I'm currently redoing everything in everything in Python, and that's interesting because uh, it's a chance to redesign everything, and I try and keep everything as simple as possible. Uh, I think you try and think about everything from the perspective of somebody using the code, but it's still, compared to everything that we do in robotics, I'm only looking at a very small, only a very small section of what needs to be done for robotics. So I can, I can work really hard and I can try and get beauty and conciseness and simplicity in the, in my patch. But at some point my patch has got to interface to other 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 systems and then that's where it all gets hard again i don't know don't know the answer but i guess in your journey what could be the most maybe maybe a reliable and interesting project you have done and maybe in general robotics field if you can also point to most interesting project i've ever done uh there's been there's been quite a few projects that i've had i've had a lot of fun with uh I had spent quite a bit of time working in automation in the mining industry. So we were working at automating very, very big machines. We built underground self-driving vehicles in the late 90s uh, that could drive through underground tunnels at 20, 30 kilometers an hour. Uh, that was Im impressive. And it was a bit of an adventure because we had to do a lot of the testing in underground mines. So we spent a lot of time at mine sites, which is an interesting experience. Um, what else? Some interesting work that we did around agricultural robots, which is a topic that interests me, interests me a lot. And at the moment, I'm not doing very much work in that. One of my younger colleagues is doing a lot more work in that area than I am at the moment. But food is a really important thing, right, for, for humans. We need food and production of food is actually quite labor intensive. And we've noticed that in this country, in Australia, with COVID, a lot of the casual workers who would normally pick food are not available. They can't get into the country. They mostly come from overseas. Uh, and so that's causing big, big problems on our farms. So yeah, the, to do a lot of, there's a lot of manual work goes into, into harvesting food. And so yeah, I think there's huge, there's huge opportunities there. And again, it's just to get into a problem like that, to get into a problem like mining robotics or agricultural robotics or underwater robotics, I've also had had uh, a, a bit of a bit of a play in. Uh, you get to learn lots of new stuff, and I think that's really interesting. So when you use the mining robots, you learn new words and you go to interesting places. Uh, with with uh, agricultural and food robotics, you know, you get to visit different places to do testing and experiments. You learn new things about food and plants and animals. Uh, 
So if you're a curious person, if you like learning, you like new things, then that's pretty exciting. Uh, it's, it's good to get out of the lab and go to other places and you know, work out how what you do connects to what other people do or what other people need. Uh, and when it comes to redundancy, um, do you think how robotics are more redundant if there's failure? Because I think that's also important, how we can design robots like more redundant. I, th I think they certainly need to be more robust. Uh, so there's lots of ways you can get to robustness. Redundancy would be, would be one way. And you know, the aerospace sector use redundancy quite a lot. But it means that you really need to have each subsystem needs to be replicated, but differently replicated, right? You need separate teams of people to, to, to work in parallel and not talk to each other and create independent systems that do, that do the same thing if you're going to have effective redundancy. Uh, I think there's a, a lot of work needs to be done around, around testing and evaluation. So before we let a robot loose on the world, what do we... What assurances do we want before we before we let the robot go? And so, yeah, we can run it around the lab for a week and didn't break, it didn't hurt anybody, so therefore it's good to go. I don't think that's true. Uh, so what is it that we do? Uh, you can't really do unit tests. I mean, if you're writing production software, you write lots of unit tests and that gives you some confidence that your software works. We don't really have unit tests for robots. We can sort of do unit tests and simulation. We can sort of test that the navigation system and the perception system work okay in a simulation environment. And then we can write, create different simulation scenarios and maybe they're a bit like unit tests. So perhaps we could get some idea about the reliability, the, the boundaries where the performance breaks of, of our robots using simulation. And I think that's something that we don't do very much is we don't push our robots to the edge of their performance limits, which is what we should do. You know, we operate them in a very safe middle ground. We don't go very fast. We don't go into featureless environments. You know, we're pretty, we kind of protect our robots. And really what we should be doing is very aggressively pushing them until they break. I think that's the cool thing about Boston Dynamics. I think that's their mantra is they, they push their robots until they break. And they make them really tough. So that if the robot falls down, then they just stand it up again and off it goes. I think uh, maybe because our robots are too, are too too expensive, we've invested too much time and effort in them, we love them and we don't want to hurt them. Uh, but I think that's wrong. I think we need to explore the bound performance boundaries. Uh, and that's going to be important. They go into the real world. They, they're not going to have us there to look after them. They're going to need to look after themselves. So I think that's, that, that's an important thing. Other thing that interests me with with respect to robustness is is deep learning. We've talked before about how it's fashionable; everyone wants to do deep learning. So you've got a robot, you've trained it, and then maybe it's out in the world. It has some new experience. It's, it learns something, right? But what I think we don't really know is if the robot learns a new thing, is that on top of everything that it's already learned before? Or does it forget a little bit? And if our robots are going to be continually learning in the real world, what's, what's the consequence of that? If I've certified the robot, evaluated it very thoroughly in a simulation environment, and it goes out into the world and has a new experience and learns something, do I need to validate it again? Because it's kind of like it's a different robot now. Uh, all, millions of neural weights will have shifted just slightly and now I don't know how it will handle uh, a case that previously it could handle. That's, I, I think there's a lot of work that needs to be done there if uh, we want to put such systems out into, out into the world and, and not hurt people. I don't know if you have any crazy ideas or aspiration. I don't know because you have done a lot of weird stuff, but I don't know what kind of thought you have in your mind that I want to do something just crazy or, yeah. You speak a lot of problems, but yeah, if you can tell crazy ideas, yeah. <laughs> I think not, not crazy. I have no, no crazy ideas. I think I am still very interested in where this deep learning intelligence, embodied intelligence takes us over, over coming years. So that's something that I will put 
I will put some time to. Uh, there are interesting application domains that I'm interested in exploring a bit more. And so some of that's around healthcare and some of that's around space robotics. So there are some opportunities coming up in this country where I can perhaps explore some of those things. Uh, I'm still very passionate about the teaching and education. So I've got big book writing project I'm on at the moment. So I'm on sabbatical leave at the moment trying to push out uh, two third editions of my book uh, and convert all the code into Python. So that's actually a much bigger task than I thought it would be. Some days I think I was just stupid for attempting to do this, but I will push through uh, and hopefully the, those things come out come out late next year. But that's probably the thing that I feel most, most passionate about. So if you're very passionate about something, even if it's a very big task, it makes it surmountable, makes it, it, makes it achievable. Uh, Pick yourself up when you feel low and just get going again. Yeah, yeah, good luck with that. Yeah, And do you think ego is important uh, for you? Sure, sure. Okay. Uh, look, I think everyone has to have some, some ego, some, some belief in, in themselves. Uh, it's probably best tempered with some, with some humility as well. But if you don't have a belief in yourself, I don't think you're going to get very much done. Uh, but you don't need to... I don't think you need to tell everybody about your belief in yourself. As long as you have the belief in yourself, I think that's sufficient. That's important, uh, that's necessary. But, uh, but yeah, it, it shouldn't, uh, you shouldn't feel the need to tell everybody else about it. So, yeah, that, that's probably all I would have to say on that, on that topic. And what could be the most important quality you have maintained through your career? And you have to maintain the most important qualities. Look, I think... I think it is, you do need perseverance uh, and you need patience. I think, uh, sometimes I say I used to be a perfectionist, but uh, I think I am probably to an extent still a perfectionist and perfectionism is actually a curse. Uh, you need to know when to let things go because if you're a perfectionist, you just keep polishing something and you'll never ship it. You know, you'll never, you never finish the paper and send it off. You never finish the book. You, know, you never finish the piece of code. So uh, I think you need to know when it's time to, to let something go. I think that that's, that that's important. Uh, and it absolutely you need to do something that you, really, that you really enjoy so that it makes it not a chore. Right? So that's when you get up in the morning, you want to do robotics. That's uh, what I wanted to do you know, every, for a very long time. I'm, I'm blessed. I guess in having a job that lets me lets me do that, think about robotics. I work with a bunch of smart people who are all thinking about robotics as well. So I've got great colleagues, great students. Uh, so yeah, it's a, it's a wonderful place to be. Since you're writing a book, what could be other books you have ever read and wasn't inspiring to? Yeah, I read a lot of I read a lot of biographies and history, uh, quite a bit of technological history, like history of computing and history of aircraft and submarines and things like that. Uh, not so much biographies of people, but histories of technology. Uh, and, and I read junk fiction. Uh, Scandinavian crime fiction is my favorite. So that's, my, that's the downs. That's the relaxation. And I don't know if you have ever received maybe advice uh, was a life changing? Maybe it's your career, life, and stick to your mind. Uh, probably one of the things that has act stuck in my mind was a colleague uh, when I was my in my very first job, and he told me to to think before I code. Uh, I probably still don't do that. Uh, but it is to take a moment to think about what you're going to do before you code it. I don't. I kind of think and compose at, at the same time. Uh, I try and do it, but uh, it's. But uh, it's, yeah, I have too many bad habits. But I think that was a it's a good piece of good piece of advice. Think before you code. I don't know if we have any final words you'd like to say for people listening to your robotics community. Any final words you'd like to say? Oh, uh, just I think that this is probably one of the most exciting topics 
going forward. Uh, I've been doing robotics for a very long time, you know, since the 1980s, and most of your listeners probably weren't born. Um, but going forward, there is so much promise, there is so much potential, so many things are coming together that this is, you know, is a pretty good time to be starting off in a career in, in robotics. Lots of, you've got such a big body of knowledge, you know, theoretical, classical knowledge about kinematics and dynamics and planning and perception. Uh, we have fantastic computing power available to us. We have this really exciting new technology, uh, deep learning, reinforcement learning, but that's not gonna be it, right? They're intriguing. I think they indicate the direction that we should be going but you know we can't just rest on that we can't just use that stuff and turn the handle we have to be thinking of the next thing but i think that is the direction that we will go we will be teaching machines machines will be uh sharing their knowledge having surprises having learning moments sharing those with each other and yeah i think that makes it super exciting also some risks right we don't know what it means when we have large numbers of artificially intelligent entities on the planet that can communicate with one another and there are dystopian futures that are being portrayed in fiction. And so we do need to, all of us, I think, need to think about that and have conversations about that uh, and make sure we, we're inventing the right future. I think that's really important. So, so think about ethics, think about the morality of what it is that you do uh, and then go, go and do exciting stuff. That's very inspiring. Thanks so much, Professor Peter. I think it was very inspiring. So sure to have you and sharing all this interesting Salt and to consider about future robotics. So thank you, thank you, and thank you for your time. I appreciate it. Thank, thank you for the invitation.